A very good evening as friends. Welcome you to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 26th of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. You can go through it. Now without much delay, let us get into the article discussion. Take a look at this news article. See this news article talks about cess and surcharge. Now suddenly this is in news because the Tamil Nadu finance minister expressed his opinion that the continuous raising of cess and surcharge has deprived the states of their legitimate share of revenue from the union government. So he urged the union government to merge the cesses and surcharges into the basic rates of tax so that the states receive their legitimate share in devolution. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this backdrop, let us learn about cess and surcharge. Cess and surcharge are the taxes levied by the union government in order to raise funds for government operations. Although both cess and surcharge add money to the government's revenue, they are different in many aspects. We will see them in detail. Now first let's see about cess. In simple terms, a cess is a tax on tax. See, cess is not levied on the total income of the person. Know that cess is levied on the amount of tax payable and it is also levied on the surcharge. Cess is only used for a specific purpose that it is collected. For example, the Indian government collects a cess on education and it would be utilized for that specific purpose alone, that is education. Moreover, cess applies to all the taxpayers and the cess collected go to the Consolidate Fund of India. This is about cess. Then what is surcharge? See, surcharge is also a tax on tax and it applies to those persons who income is more than 50 lakhs. See, surcharge is not collected for any specific purpose and it can be used for any reason as the union government sees fit. Remember, it also applies on the amount of tax payable and not on the total income of the person. And the tax amount collected on surcharge also goes to the Consolidate Fund of India. This is about surcharge. Now let's understand the difference between cess and surcharge. Firstly, the difference is in the tax rate. See, the cess is a fixed rate of tax, whereas the surcharge rate varies among 10%, 15%, 25% and 37% depending on the total income of the taxpayer. This is the first difference. Secondly, the difference is in the calculation. See, the government authorities calculate cess on the surcharge and the total tax payable. But the surcharge is calculated on the total tax amount only. So this is the second difference. Thirdly, the difference is in the levy. See, the union government levies cess on every taxpayer. Whereas, the government levies a surcharge on those individuals who have a higher taxable income. This is the third difference. Fourthly, the difference is in the purpose. See, the union government can use cess for a particular purpose only and it cannot be used for any arbitrary reason. A surcharge on the other hand can be used for any reason and here the reason does not have to be specified by the government. So this is the fourth difference. And finally, the difference is in the aim. See, the CIS aims to raise funds for some particular expenditure costs. On the other hand, a surcharge aims to place a tax burden on those whose income is beyond rupees 50 lakhs. See, these are all some of the differences between CIS and surcharge. Kindly make note of it. Now, before concluding our discussion, let's see some similarities about CIS and surcharge. Firstly, the center government is the sole authority that levies both CIS and surcharge. So, this is one similarity. Secondly, both cess and surcharge that are collected will be taken into the Consolidate Fund of India. So, this is the second similarity. Finally, state governments do not have any share of cess and surcharge from the union government. So, these are all the similarities about cess and surcharge. That's all regarding this discussion. Through this discussion, we learned about cess, surcharge, then the similarities and differences between cess and surcharge. See, this type of economic topics are very, very important for your preliminary examination. Kindly make note of it. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It talks about Sangeet Natak Academy. The news is that Sangeet Natak Academy has bestowed special one-time awards on 86 artists from across the country. See, this is done in commemorating 75 years of India's independence. 
This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about Sangeet Natak Academy in prelims perspective. See, the Sangeet Natak Academy is India's national academy for music, dance and drama. Here, drama also includes puppetry and various folk and tribal art forms. Know that Sangeet Natak Academy is the first national academy for arts set up by Republic of India. The academy was set up in 1953 and it is functioning as an autonomous body under the Ministry of Culture. Though it is functioning under Ministry of Culture, it was created by a resolution of Ministry of Education in the year 1952. Know that the academy is fully funded by Government of India. See, the Ministry of Culture has declared the Sangeet Natak Academy as the nodal centre for coordinating India's nominations for various lists at the international level. For example, we may quote India's nomination to UNESCO Heritage Site List. Then, Sangeet Natak Academy is also a nodal agency in developing and maintaining the national inventory of intangible cultural heritage list along with UNESCO. See, the Sangeet Natak Academy also confers awards to the artists. And this Sangeet Natak Academy Award are the highest national recognition conferred on practicing artists. Additionally, note that the Academy gives fellowships known as Academy Ratna. And the Sangeet Natak Academy has also its own archive. It comprises audio and video tapes, photographs and films. And this archive is one of the largest in the country and it is extensively used for research in the performing arts field. This is a brief about Sangeet Natak Academy. Now let's see some of the important objectives of Sangeet Natak Academy. Firstly, the main function of Sangeet Natak Academy is to coordinate the activities of regional or state academies of dance, drama and music. Secondly, the academy promote research in the fields of Indian dance, drama and music. And for this research purpose, it also aims to establish a library and museum. This is the second main objective. Now coming to the third objective, the Sankit Natak Academy cooperate with such similar academies and other institutions and associations for the furtherance of its objectives and for the enrichment of Indian culture as a whole. Fourthly, the academy encourages the exchange of ideas and enrichment of techniques between the different regions in regard to arts of dance, drama and music. And finally, the Sangeet Natak Academy encourages the establishment of theatre centres on the basis of regional languages. And the academy also promotes cooperation among different theatre centres. This is all about the objectives of Sangeet Natak Academy. And that's all regarding this discussion. Through this discussion, we learned about Sangeet Natak Academy and some of its main objectives. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this editorial article. First of all, I wish you a happy Constitution Day 2022. See, the Constitution Day is celebrated in India on 26th November every year. It is celebrated to commemorate the adoption of Constitution of India. As we all know, the Constituent Assembly adopted the Constitution of India on 26th November 1949. And the Constitution came into effect on 26th January 1950. So, this day is very special in the aspect of Indian political system. And this is the reason today we have an editorial article about the Indian Constitution. See, in overall, the author through this article expressed his concern that though the Constitution is an integral part of our life, there is only less awareness about the Indian Constitution. And this is about the article. Now, in this backdrop, we will learn about how the Indian Constitution was made and we will also go through the salient features of Indian Constitution. Now, before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is highlighted here. You can go through it. Now, let's begin our discussion with the making of the Indian Constitution. See, the Indian Constitution was framed by the Constituent Assembly. See, the demand for Constituent Assembly was officially made in the year 1935 and this demand was made by Indian National Congress. Following this, in the year 1938, Jawaharlal Nehru declared that the Constitution of India will be framed without the interference of any outsiders or Britishers. Then there was a question. The question is that who will frame the Constitution for India? For this, Jawaharlal Nehru answered that the Constituent Assembly elected on the basis of adult franchise will frame the constitution of India. So, the demands of INC were accepted in August offer in the year 1940. 
finally the draft proposal for the framing of an independent constitution was brought to india and this was brought in the year 1942 by sir strafford cripps a member of the british cabinet though it was initially rejected by muslim league the proposal was later on accepted then the constituent assembly was constituted in november 1946 under the scheme formulated by cabinet mission plan now what are all the features of this scheme under cabinet mission plan see i will list out the features one by one see the total strength of the constituent assembly was to be 389 of these 296 seats were to be allotted to british india and 93 seats to princely states this is the first feature the second feature is that each province and princely state were to be allotted seats in proportion to their respective population this is the second feature then the third feature is that the method of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote was followed in the election process then the other feature is that the representative of princely states were to be nominated by the heads of princely states so these are all some of the features formulated by cabinet mission plan now what does this feature signifies it tells us that the members of the constituent assembly was not directly elected on the basis of adult franchise that is the constituent assembly is a partly elected and partly nominated body okay then the constituent assembly also appointed a number of committees to deal with different tasks of constitution making out of these eight were major committees and others were minor committees see this table here i have given you the major committees pass the video and go through it then after almost 3 years of hard work the constitution was completed and adopted by the constituent assembly on november 26 1949 know that it was brought into effect only on january 26 1950 though it was adopted on november 26 1949 now why the date the january 26 is chosen see this date was chosen because it was on this day in 1930 the inc made purna swaraj or complete independence as its goal so this is the reason the constitution was brought into force on january 26 and this is about the making of indian constitution now we will discuss in brief about the salient or important features of indian constitution the first feature is the indian constitution is the lengthiest as well as written constitution see the four major factors which have made our constitution lengthy are the first is the geographical factors see india is a vast country and it is a diverse nation hence it needs such a lengthy written constitution second is the historical factors see the influence of government of india act 1935 makes it a lengthy written constitution third is single constitution see for both the center and states this is the one and only constitution that is why it is so lengthy and written to avoid conflicts fourth is the domination of legal luminaries in the constituent assembly for example the constituent assembly consisted b r ambedkar who was a lawyer at that time this is all about the first feature the second feature of the indian constitution is it is drawn from various sources see for example the structural part of the constitution is largely derived from the government of india act 1935 then if you take fundamental rights it is derived from us constitution okay this is about the second feature now coming to the third feature indian constitution is a blend of rigidity and flexibility to be clear there are special procedures to amend the constitution and there are some limitations as well in the amending of constitution thus indian constitution is a blend of rigidity and flexibility this is about the third feature the fourth feature is indian constitution advocates for federal system with unitary basis of government in india see it has few features of federation like two governments division of powers written constitution etc also constitution has few unitary features like a strong center single constitution single citizenship etc so the constitution of india providing for federal system with unitary basis this is the fourth feature the fifth feature is the constitution advocates for parliamentary form of government to india so it follows the principle of cooperation and coordination between the legislature and executive organs this is the fifth feature the sixth feature of the indian constitution is it is a synthesis of parliamentary sovereignty and judicial supremacy 
see on one hand the parliament can amend the major portion of the constitution on the other hand the supreme court has the power of judicial review thus the constitution advocates for synthesis of parliamentary sovereignty and judicial supremacy this is the sixth feature now coming to the seventh feature constitution provides for integrated and independent judiciary see the supreme court stands at the top of the integrated judicial system in the country below there are high courts at the state level then under a high court there is a hierarchy of subordinate courts thus we say the indian judiciary is integrated also note that neither the legislature nor the executive organs can influence the order of a court that is why we call the indian judiciary to be as independent and this is the seventh feature then the eighth feature the constitution has fundamental rights for promoting the idea of political democracy and this is for all the citizens of india this is the eighth feature now coming to the ninth feature the constitution has directive principles of state policy for promoting the ideal of social and economic democracy and this helps the government to establish a welfare state this is the ninth feature then the tenth feature is the fundamental duties and this were added to the indian constitution by 42nd constitution amendment act see this is added to remind the citizens of their duty to the nation this is the 10th feature now coming to the 11th feature the constitution stands for a secular state see this means it does not uphold any particular religion as the official religion of the state this is the 11th feature the 12th feature is the provision of universal adult franchise see this means every citizen who is not less than 18 years of age can vote in the elections this is the 12th feature now coming to the 13th the constitution has the provision of single citizenship this means in india all citizens irrespective of the state in which they are born or reside enjoy the same political and civil rights this is the 13th feature then the 14th feature is constitution provides for the establishment of independent bodies like the election commission comptroller and auditor general etc and these bodies are the bulwark of democratic system of government in india for example take the election commission it is solely responsible for conducting free and fair elections in the country this is the 14th feature now coming to the 15th feature the constitution provides for emergency provisions this provisions is to enable the president to meet any extraordinary situation effectively thereby it safeguards the sovereignty unity integrity and security of the country this is the 15th feature now coming to the final feature the constitution provides for a three tier government see originally there was only a two tier government with center and state governments later a third tier which is the local government was added by 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment acts see these are all some of the important features of indian constitution you have to remember and that's all regarding this discussion through this discussion we learned about how the constitution was made then some facts about constituent assembly and finally about the salient features of indian constitution see this topic is very important for your both prelims and mains examination kindly make note of it with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article this news article talks about national human rights commission which is shortly known as nhrc the news is that the recent assam meghalaya border firing seems to be a clear violation of human rights in this backdrop the meghalaya chief minister has asked the national human rights commission to ensure action against the assam police force and the assam forest guards and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn some points about national human rights commission see the national human rights commission is a statutory body and it was established by an act called the protection of human rights act 1993 now what is the purpose of this commission see the commission acts as the watchdog of human rights in the country here the rights relating to life liberty equality and dignity of an individual is taken into account because these rights are guaranteed by constitution and they are embodied in the international covenants this is about the purpose now talking about the composition of the commission remember the commission is a multi member body consisting of chairperson and five members now let's see about the qualification of chairperson and the members see the chairperson should be a retired chief justice of india or a judge of the supreme court among full time members one should be a serving or retired judge of supreme court then another one should be serving or retired chief justice of high court 
and the three other persons should be having knowledge or practical experience with respect to human rights know that out of these five members at least one should be a woman then in addition to these full time members the commission also has seven ex officio members see i have listed out the seven members here pause the video and go through it so overall the national human rights commission consists of one chairman five full time members and seven ex officio members and this is all about composition now we will see about important powers and functions of national human rights commission firstly the main mandate of national human rights commission is to inquire into any violation of human rights throughout the country secondly the commission has the power to take co moto action for preventing any human rights violations thirdly officials of national human rights commission have the power to visit jails and detention places this is to study the living conditions of inmates and they also make recommendations to the government regarding living conditions of prisoners and finally national human rights commission is mandated to take any petitions from the aggrieved persons or any other persons regarding human rights violation this is all about important functions and powers of national human rights commission and that's all regarding this discussion through this discussion we came to know about national human rights commission its purpose then its composition and finally about some important functions and powers of national human rights commission with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article the news is that farmers in kutanad region of kerala are finding it difficult to arrange paddy seeds for the next sowing season the article also says that even though the paddy is cultivated in large tracts of land in kutanad its record on seed production for sowing remains poor so the farmers in the region are largely dependent on agricultural department for seeds at a subsidized rate and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let's learn about the famous kutanad below sea level paddy cultivation and also about globally important agricultural heritage system of food and agricultural organization now let's first start with kutanad region of kerala see kutanad is a region covering the alappula kottayam and pattanamtitta districts in the state of kerala see kutanad is well known for its vast paddy fields and geographical peculiarities know that kutanad wetland agriculture system is unique as it is the only system in india that favors rice cultivation below sea level and the land here are created by draining delta swamps in brackish waters the kutanad agri system is a complex mosaic of fragmented agricultural landscapes and it is divided into three structures now let's see them one by one the first structure is the wetlands and it is used for paddy activities and fish catching second structure is the garden lands which is used for coconut tubers and food crops plantation and finally the water areas here it is used for inland fishing and this is about the kutanad region now we will see about the rice fields of kutanad see the rice fields in kutanad region are popularly known as punjavayals and they exist in three landscape elements firstly karapadam which is upland rice fields then comes kayal which are wetland rice fields and finally kari which is nothing but land buried with black coal like materials so this is about the landscape elements of kutanad see kutanad is historically important region in the ancient history of south india and it is the major rice producing region in the kerala state farmers of kutanad are famous for biosaline farming know that biosaline farming literally means the production and growth of plants in saline rich ground water and or soil also remember that food and agricultural organization has declared the kutanad farming system as globally important agricultural heritage system now what is this globally important agricultural heritage system see it is a program of united nations food and agricultural organization globally important agricultural heritage system was founded during 2002 world summit on sustainable development in south africa see it is a global partnership initiative to protect and support family farming and the overall goal of the globally important agricultural heritage system is to identify and safeguard globally important agricultural systems and their associated landscapes then it also safeguards agricultural biodiversity knowledge systems and culture know that there are around 65 plus sites in the world as part of globally important agricultural heritage systems 
and this is all about globally important agricultural heritage systems and that's all regarding this discussion through this discussion we came to know about kutanad region of kerala then about the rice fields of kutanad and finally about globally important agricultural heritage system of food and agricultural organization with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article it speaks about national green tribunal which is shortly called as ngt the issue is that telangana state power generation corporation limited is building yadadri thermal power station near amrabad tiger reserve in telangana there are some concerns that this power station if operationalized it will lead to environmental pollution and because of this concern recently the national green tribunal ordered for a reappraisal of the project so as per national green tribunal order the ministry of environment and forest has constituted an expert appraisal committee to look into this issue now the expert appraisal committee is asking for various additional information from the telangana state power generation corporation regarding the thermal power station project and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn about national green tribunal in prelims perspective see the national green tribunal was established in the year 2010 as per the national green tribunal act see it is a specialized judicial body and it is equipped with expertise solely for the purpose of adjudicating environmental cases in the country know that the tribunal was set up as per recommendations of the supreme court and the law commission see national green tribunal is established for effective and expeditious disposal of cases relating to environmental protection and conservation of forests and other natural resources ngt also looks after the enforcement of any legal right relating to environment also know that the tribunal shall not be bound by the procedure laid down under the code of civil procedure and it shall be guided by principles of natural justice the tribunal's order are binding and it has power to grant relief in the form of compensation and damages to affected persons see this is a brief about national green tribunal now let's see about the composition see the tribunal has a presence in five zones that is north central east south and west the principal bench is situated in the northern zone which has its headquarters at delhi and the central zone bench is situated in bhopal then east zone in kolkata then southern zone in chennai and west zone in pune see the principal bench of the tribunal is headed by chairperson then it has minimum of 10 and maximum of 20 full time judicial as well as expert members and this is about the composition now we will learn about the jurisdiction of tribunal see any person may approach the national green tribunal for seeking relief and compensation and they approach for environmental damage involving subjects in the legislations mentioned in schedule 1 of the national green tribunal act 2010 see the legislations in schedule 1 are listed here pause the video and go through it moving on the tribunal has jurisdictions over all civil cases involving a substantial question relating to environment Additionally any person aggrieved by an order or direction of any of the appellate authorities under the legislations mentioned in the schedule 1 of the National Green Tribunal Act 2010 they can also challenge them before the National Green Tribunal and that's all regarding this discussion through this discussion we came to know about National Green Tribunal its composition and finally about the jurisdiction of National Green Tribunal see these types of topics are very very important for your preliminary exam So make note of each and every fact that we discussed in this article. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It speaks about Aero India show. The news is that the Aero India 2023 will be going to held at Yelahanka Air Force Station. It will be starting on February 30 next year and a large number of Indian and foreign exhibitors are expected to participate in this event. And this is the essence of the news article given here. in this context let us quickly go through what is aero india show see aero india is a biennial international military and civil air show it is organized for anyone who would like to learn about aviation and to explore aircraft and technology in this show the indian air force and the indian defense ministry collaborate to display magnificent machines planes and helicopters that are deployed by indian air force 
see aero india is a premier event the draws international and indian military and civil aircraft makers and the show also attracts other defense industries government dignitaries and business visitors since 1996 the show has been held in yalahanka air base which is about 300 km from the city of bangalore see 2021 air india show was organized by the defense exhibition organization which is functioning under ministry of defense before that in 2019 the show was organized by hindustan aeronautics limited and in the next year that is in 2023 it is again going to be organized by hindustan aeronautics limited see this biennial show traditionally held for about 5 days normally the first 3 days of the air show are reserved for business visitors and the last 2 days are open to general public but in 2021 the show was reduced to a 3 day affair due to covid pandemic and the public viewing days are cancelled and this 2021 show was promoted as the world's first hybrid air show in which the business element of the event was held both in physical as well as virtual mode but in the next year the exhibition will be back to its form that is it will be conducted for 5 days so this is all about air india show Now let's see in brief about Defence Exhibition Organisation of Ministry of Defence. See Defence Exhibition Organisation is an autonomous organisation of the Indian government established in 1981. This organisation was established to promote export potential of the Indian defence industry and the agency is also responsible for organising international exhibitions such as Def Expo and it ensures Indian participation at overseas exhibitions. and that's all regarding this defense exhibition organization through this discussion we came to know about aero india show then why it is conducted and finally about the defense exhibition organization of ministry of defense with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article this news article talks about the insurance regulatory and development authority of india which is shortly known as irdai news is that the insurance regulator irdai approved a number of proposals see the proposals were approved in an effort to promote insurance sectors ease of doing business and this is the crux of the news article given here in this background let us understand about irdai in prelims perspective see the insurance regulatory and development authority of india which is shortly known as irdai is a statutory body which was established in the year 1999 know that the body derives its powers and functions from the IRDAA Act 1999 and Insurance Act 1938 it is functioning as an regulatory body under the jurisdiction of Ministry of Finance see IRDAA is tasked with regulating and licensing the insurance and reinsurance industries in India its main purpose is to safeguard the interests of the policy holders then some of the other purposes of irdai are they protect the interest of policy holders then they regulate and promote the orderly growth of insurance and reinsurance industry then irdai also ensure speedy claim settlement and preventing insurance frauds and other mal practices then irdai also works in bettering the standards of insurance markets and irdai also has an power to take action when established regulatory standards are ineffectively enforced these are all the purposes of irdai now talking about its composition see the irdai is a 10 member team consisting of a chairman five whole time members and four part time members note that they are all appointed by government of india now talking about the tenure of the members see the chairperson and every other whole time member and part time member shall hold office for the term of 5 years from the date on which he or she enters upon his office remember one fact here chairperson and all members are eligible for reappointment as well now talking about the removal of members see the central government may remove any member from office at any time before being removed the members can be given a reasonable opportunity to be heard this is about the composition tenure and removal now let's see how irdai works See the IRDAI frames rules and regulations without any ambiguity towards any particular insurance company and to ensure fairness and financial soundness of the industry the main work of the IRDAI revolves around the policy holders interests 
So this is about IRDI working. Now let's see the type of insurances that is regulated by IRDI. See here insurance is mainly divided into two types. They are life and non-life insurance. Here the non-life insurance is also called as general insurance. See there are some components under life insurance and non-life insurance. We will see them one by one. Firstly the components included in the life insurance are term plans, endowment policies, unit linked insurance policies, retirement policies and money back policies. And the components which are included in non-life or general insurance are health insurance policies, vehicle or motor insurance policies, property insurance policies, travel insurance policies and gadget insurance policies. So these are all some of the components under life insurance and non-life insurance. And that's all regarding this discussion. Through this discussion we came to know about IRDAI that is the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India, then its purpose, then composition and finally about regulation activities of IRDAI. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now look at this first question, consider the following statements with reference to cess and surcharge. Let's take up the first statement. Once the purpose for which the cess is levied is completed, it is removed. See this statement is correct, a cess is not a permanent source of revenue for government. And once the purpose for which the cess is levied is completed, it is removed. So statement 1 is correct. Now coming to the second statement, article 270 of the constitution allows cess to be excluded from the purview of divisible pool of taxes that the central government must share with the states. Yes, this statement is also correct. Article 270 mentions cess is not to be shared with state governments. So statement 2 is correct. Now the question is asking for correct statement. So the answer for the question is option C both 1 and 2. Moving on. Let's take up the second question. Consider the following statements with reference to Sangeet Natak Academy. Now let's take up the first statement. It functions as the apex body of all art forms in the country. See this statement is incorrect because Sangeet Natak Academy is the apex body for performing arts in the country and not for all art forms. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement. It is a statutory body under Ministry of Culture. See this statement is also incorrect because it was not created by the Parliamentary Act and it was created by a resolution of Ministry of Education in 1952 and presently it is functioning as an autonomous body under Ministry of Culture and it is not the statutory body. So statement 2 is incorrect. Now the question is asking for correct statement. So the answer for the question is option D neither one nor two. Now coming to the third question consider the following statements with respect to National Human Rights Commission. Let's take up the first statement. Chairperson is appointed by the President on recommendation of committee. Yes, this statement is correct because the chairperson and members are appointed by the President on recommendations of six member committee. And the committee consists of Prime Minister as its head, then the Speaker of Lok Sabha, the Deputy Chairman of Raj Sabha, and the Leader of Oppositions in both Houses of Parliament and the Central Home Minister. So statement 1 is correct. Now coming to the second statement. Chairperson and members hold office for only 5 years. See this statement is incorrect because the chairperson and members holds office for a term of 3 years or until they attain the age of 70 years whichever is earlier. I know that after their tenure the chairperson and members are not eligible for further employment under the central or state government and they can be removed by the president. Now coming to the second statement it is incorrect. Because the chairperson and members hold office for a term of 3 years. Now the question is asking for correct statement. So the correct answer for the question is option A one only. Moving on, let's take up the fourth question. Which of the following is are recognized as globally important agriculture heritage systems by Food and Agricultural Organization of United Nations? Here four statements is given. We have to pick the correct statement. First one, Saffron Heritage of Kashmir. Yes, this is correct. It was included in GIAHS. Then second one, Koraput traditional agriculture. See this is also included in GIAHS. So second statement is also correct. Now coming to the third statement, Kutanad below sea level farming system. See as we saw in the discussion, it is also included in GIAHS. So third statement also correct. Now coming to the fourth statement, traditional agriculture in deltas of river Godavari. See this agriculture system is not yet included in GIAHS. Only first three are 
included in JAHS. So here the question is asking for correct statements. So the answer for the question is option D 1, 2 and 3 only. Moving on, let's take up the fifth question. Consider the following statements. Let's take up the first statement. India is the seventh largest civil aviation market in the world and is set to become the world's third largest by 2024. Yes, this statement is correct. According to International Air Transport Association, India is the seventh largest civil aviation market in the world and it is set to become world's third largest by 2024 by overtaking United Kingdom. So, statement 1 is correct. Coming to the second statement, being a statutory body, the Airports Authority of India manages the building, enhancing, servicing and management of civil aviation infrastructure in India. Since the second statement is also correct, the Airport Authority of India, which is shortly known as AAI, was founded in 1995 and it was created through the Airports Authority of India Act 1994 and it is functioning under Ministry of Civil Aviation and it is also a statutory body. So the second statement is correct. Now the question is asking for correct statement. So the answer for the question is option C both 1 and 2. Now coming to the final question, consider the following statements with reference to Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority IRDAI. Let's take up the first statement. IRDAI is the principal regulator for stock exchanges in India. See this statement is wrong because the Security and Exchange Board of India which is shortly known as SEBI is the regulatory authority of stock markets and not IRDAI. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement, IRDAI was established in 1999 following the recommendation of Malhotra Committee report in 1999. Yes, this statement is correct. In 1999, it was established based on the recommendations of Malhotra Committee report in 1999 and later on it was incorporated as a statutory body in April 2000. So second statement is correct. Now the question is asking for correct statement. Here second statement alone is correct. So the correct answer for the question is option B 2 only. And this is a quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in a community section. Try to answer it. Displayed here is the main question for your practice. Go through the question, write your answer and post it in the comment section. With this we come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.